Am I good? Okay, so I'm I just good. have to yell to them. I know how to do that. I know how to do that. Okay, folks, we're back on. I'd like to introduce our next speaker. I could, I could do that in a bunch of different ways. Uh, <laughs> Dr. Tracy Davenport, professor of psychology, wife, uh, mother of my two sometimes okay kids, no, good kids. Uh, but at, at this point, I'd, I'd, I'd say the best introduction is that Tracy has some information that could be a game changer with some of your athletes. I know it is with our son, I know it is with me, and I've seen it with some of the athletes, not only on our team, but on other teams. I'll let her go into more detail. Uh, Tracy's now uh, a professor of psychology at Chesapeake College, which is down the street from here. You ready to go? I'm ready to rock. There you go. All right, can everybody hear me in the back? Yes, thank you. Um, I first want to thank you guys very um, sincerely. Um, I'll jump right into it because I have 18 minutes, but I need to take 30 seconds to thank you for being here. I'm a mother of a high school athlete, and I know that many of you are parents, and you work full time in other places, and you came today, a lot of you on your own time and on your own expense, and how much I appreciate the extra stuff that you're doing for our children. So thank you very sincerely. Um, I want to talk to you today about food intolerances and your athletes. This is a hot topic, but you haven't seen anything yet. What's coming down the pike, what I'm going to tell you um, about three quarters of the way through the talk is going to surprise some of you. You're going to be hearing a lot about this, whether you're in K through 12 or whether you're going to be in a college environment. Um, there's a lot of good to it. It's kind of like stretching where we were in the 80s. I spoke at the U.S. Rowing Convention back in, I think, probably the, the late 80s, and the University of Miami, sorry to throw him under the bus, raised his hand and said, we don't have time to stretch. So all of this stuff, a lot of things you're going to feel like you don't have time to think about, but I promise you, you're going to need to think about it. So let me jump in. First of all, we're talking about food intolerances and food allergies. They can be two different things. I think it's helpful just to think of them on a continuum. Everything from anaphylactic shock, which I'll talk about just for a second today, and then all the way down to people just having just an overall bellyache or a headache all the time from not being able to digest food properly. So um, just to make sure I have control here. Um, I've got a lot of information on these slides. Maybe it's not as visually pleasing, but I think it's awfully darn important, so I kept it on there. I'm going to talk to you about studies that have happened just in the last few years. Anything that has a 2000 on it, if you're in research, which I was for a few years, it's pretty current because it takes a while for this stuff to make it public. Um, okay, now this thing is going by itself, so. Um, I want to talk about 20.8% uh, of people studied recently were allergic to nuts, fruits, milk. Think about it. In a room of 100, 20% of people in a laboratory setting had adverse reactions to either nuts, fruits, and milk. One out of five people. Okay? Think about it in terms of the numbers of your teams. Next, please. We're going to break it down now by food. Again, I'm still talking about the prevalence of food allergies. In other studies, prevalence of food allergy varied from 1% to 17% for milk. It depends on how much milk somebody has. It depends on uh, how it's measured. There's where you see the variation. But again, you have to think about up to 17% if you throw some people in a room that they're going to be allergic to milk. And I'm going to break that down demographically, and it's going to blow you out of the water, I promise. Next one, please. When we look at egg in terms of food allergies or intolerances, it can go up to 7% for a group of people in a lab. Next, please. And for shellfish, we're talking about up to 10% of the population may be allergic or at least intolerant to shellfish. Next, please. For any food, when you put people, you ask, you give them surveys or you bring them into a laboratory, we can see almost 30% of people having an issue with at least one food in our food stream. Now, a whole lot on the slide for you to look at, but I don't want you to forget it when you go home, okay? So really, right now, make your brain work. It's estimated that about 25% of Americans and 75% of individuals worldwide seem to suffer from lactose maldigestion, not able to digest dairy products and the proteins in dairy products. 
Now, here's the part that's going to blow you out of the water that I promised. Earlier estimates report that about 50% of the Hispanic population, almost 100% of the Asian population, and about 80% of African Americans suffer from lactose maldigestion. This is a study from 2009. Okay? We're looking at when we pull people out demographically, what it looks like and what genetically we're programmed to do or not do. Now, I have the slide on top of all those words. This is one day of my math and science camp for girls. It happens here locally. I want you to look at the demographics of America today. We sometimes don't think about this, you know, because our demographics have changed over the years, but now we're one of the most diverse countries in the world. Even though we kind of don't think that about ourselves, you have to look at who we are, and then you have to look at those stats underneath there. Okay, next please. Everybody's heard of celiac disease at this point and gluten intolerances. We're looking at about 7%, 7 out of 100 people right now, as of 2013, is estimated to be gluten intolerant when we look at subjects. Okay. Now, let's talk about your lives. How might these food intolerances or food allergies appear in your athletes? Well, a lot of different ways. That's what's been very tricky about the whole food allergy and food intolerant uh, situation. One is that you might have a teenage girl on your team, and a lot of times teenage girls will say things like, I just don't want to eat. I just don't feel well when I eat. What do we immediately think of that when we think about a teenage girl not wanting to eat? Eating disorders. We think of anniversary, Anna, for, <laughs> anorexia nervosa. I can see it, but I couldn't say it. And bulimia, right? And so we put these girls in therapy instead of taking dairy or some other things out of their diet. And again, they'll say, I still don't feel like eating, right? And now we get them into more therapy. This is what we have to watch out for, food avoidance, stuffiness, shortness of breath. Sometimes somebody can tolerate food that's cooked, but when it's raw, they're completely stuffy immediately. Stomach aches, headaches, fatigue, waking up and just feeling tired all the time. You have an athlete that no matter how much sleep he or she is getting, they're just dragging around. Weight gain or loss, skin rash or itchiness. We've all seen people that have reacted to something, but you're not sure what. Uh, GI distress, just feeling very gassy all the time. Bad behavior. We think about bad behavior with little kids, but we can see bad behavior in high schoolers and college-age students from not feeling well, just overall being in a really bad mood, for example. Um, poor performance both academically and ath athletically. And worst case, especially when we talk about peanuts and shellfish, um, anaphylactic shock. shock. We have a funny story. It's not really funny, but they're still friends. Um, Mike had a, a person that came here to interview for the assistant coaching job. He went to get her ice cream in the cafeteria, and he used the same scoop that would be used on an ice cream she couldn't have that had peanuts in it. And as soon as she took a bite, she looked at him and said, where's the hospital? And he had to take her over to the emergency room during the interview. <coughs> I hired her. But. He hired her. <laughs> he thought if he could put her through that, and she was on speaking terms. But she was to the point, so you have to even think staff now, not only rowers, but staff, she was to the point where she couldn't pick up garbage around the trailer because there might be a granola wrapper that had peanuts on it. So we see this whole thing along a continuum. So look, why should you care? You know, so many things have been thrown at you guys today and for all of your lives. I, I get it. But let's talk first about good karma. I don't know how you feel about karma. I'm just one of those people, and maybe because it's just I just turned 50, is that I feel like if you can make somebody else's life easier along the way, somewhere along the way, maybe they'll make your life easy. You've got to look at the prevalence of this. If you don't know somebody with a food intolerance or someone in your family doesn't have it, you better put yet at the end of that sentence, okay? It's coming. It's really important that you make other people's lives better so maybe when it happens to you or your family, hopefully you got some good karma coming back. Common sense, the experience of the athlete. If the athlete isn't feeling well, they're not gonna have a good overall experience. Team performance, same thing. Team unity, look, if you all go to Pizza Hut and two people can't eat pizza or they know they will eat pizza so they can get along with everybody and be part of the winning team, but they know they're going to pay a heavy duty price when they get back home. That's not team unity. Even though you say, we have to all eat together, right? We're all about eating in this culture. And finally, I want to talk to you about lawsuits. On the other end of the spectrum of good karma is lawsuits. How many people here are in public education? Anybody? 
enough. Um, remember that in public education, your child's right to a free and appropriate public education is guaranteed by federal law, specifically Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973. Right now, we're looking to apply that to field trips, to after-school activities. Food is now going to become part of that. If it hasn't already, you're going to get a savvy parent who says, look, every time my kid comes here, you're serving things that he or she can't have that are making them sick or, best case, uncomfortable. And they could sue you under 504. I want you to really understand that. Look, look what happened just one month ago. Department of Justice, I brought the press release. Students at Leslie University brought a lawsuit and won. The Justice Department today announced an agreement with Leslie University in Cambridge, Mass, to ensure that students with celiac disease and other food allergies can fully and equally enjoy the university's meal plan and food services in compliance with the Americans with Disabilities Act. One month ago, at the college level, students came and brought a suit against the university under the Americans with Disabilities Act, saying, the university is not providing for me, not in crew races or not in the cafeteria, right now we see it going down. And this is going to be a game changer across campuses nationwide. Okay? Now, I'm just going to end in my last seven minutes. What can you do about it? I know you guys have a lot on your plate. That's you. I know I've been married to a rowing coach for going on 26 years. I know how hard you work. Trust me, I do. You got a lot going on. So I'm going to give you some simple ways to kind of help manage this. That's you, holding the world on your shoulders. First thing is, don't look back. You know the old Fleetwood Mac song? Don't stop thinking, thinking backwards. You've got to look forward. I know a lot of you may be thinking, ah, doggone it, this wasn't an issue when I was a kid. We just ate anything we wanted, and now look at this. Just problems, right? But the number of kids with food allergies went up 18%. 18% from 1997 to 2007, according to the U.S. Center for Disease Control. We're looking at a jump of 18% in 10 years. I want you to think about something that really hits home for me. My aunt and grandmother, I come from a German background, every day made homemade sweet rolls. In my aunt's sweet rolls and my grandma's sweet rolls were uh, flour, sugar, eggs, butter, baking soda, salt, and cinnamon. And on a good day, they'd throw some yeast in there if they had extra time, right? How many ingredients? Maybe five or six? I stopped on the way here a couple days ago, and I picked up a honey bun at our shore stop, a sweet roll. There are 53 ingredients now in a sweet roll. Does anybody really now are surprised by that first slide on how we've changed what we're eating and what we're giving our children? I'm just saying, come on, we can't be super surprised now, right? Second easy thing to do is just educate your staff. Educate your rowers. You know, bring it out in the open. This is real stuff, and it's nobody's fault. We always want to say, oh, Johnny's being so high maintenance. Now he's worrying about where we're going to stop for dinner after the race, right? We all work with high maintenance people. I have 155 students a week. I work with some high maintenance people. I'm just saying. I get you. But this is nobody's fault, okay? It's not an athlete's choice to have a food sensitivity or a food intolerance or a food allergy. Number three, don't be afraid to bring this up. I know that a lot of us, and me included, think, you know what, maybe if I just don't say anything about it, <laughs> it'll go away, right? The can of worms is already open on this topic. Um, last year, gluten-free product sales topped $1.6 billion in our country representing the sixth straight year of increases of 20 to 25 percent or higher. And restaurants who are going after the market share, like P.F. Chang's, already figured it out. The can's open. If you go to P.F. Chang's, the first thing they say when they come to your table, um, does anybody here have any food intolerances or sensitivities? They got it. I just bought stock in Whole Foods this year. They got it, right? This is a topic that is already happening, okay? Now, number four. Many students have been managing this situation since birth. They are savvy. They didn't just come up with this last year, and now they're going to be at a complete loss. You just need to help them a little bit, I promise you. I'm a mother of a, of a person with food intolerances. Give them just a little bit of help. Say, hey, Tim, you know, after the regatta, you know, we're going to be stopping here or there. Any of those work for you? 
Or one simple thing to do is like, hey, I'm going to have some coolers that I'm going to be taking to the next race. I'm going to leave half a cooler open for anybody that needs to throw anything in there. These are savvy individuals. They've been dealing with very complex issues their entire life. They're good at it. Trust me. Next. Last but not least, make sure whoever is in charge of food in your program understands athlete differences and the best ways to take care of your athletes. This is a pretty easy thing to do. It's all about just thinking through ahead of time. If, um, for example, if you're going to have a lot of tailgating at your regattas where parents are going to bring food, I put in your packet just a brief little paragraph, a talking point. If you don't want to go home and, you know, pound your head against the wall to figure out how to communicate this, then communicate it this way. You may say something like, as many of you know, there are several students on our team who have a variety of needs when it comes to food. Therefore, having a few food choices available to them that are gluten, nut, and dairy-free would be greatly appreciated by the students and coaching staff. Send that out to your parents. I put that paragraph in your packet so um, they'll know to bring things like, give them examples, fresh fruit, uh, lunch meat, just things that aren't overly processed works for a lot of people. Um, the other thing about, I just want to kind of finish with, is away regattas. A lot of times you're on the road, you have to stop at Pizza Hut or McDonald's. You know, I'm an athlete from a long time ago. It was all about pizza. I get it. I love pizza. It's one of my favorite five food groups. Diet Coke, pizza, brownies. I got them, right? Um, but pizza is a really poor choice. If you don't know that already, then you have to think. Pizza is made of uh, usually something with a lot of gluten in it. It's usually made wheat-based. You know, places are offering more now, but a lot of times it's wheat-based. The next thing that goes on pizza is acid, tomato sauce. So anybody with gastroesophageal reflux, reflux disease, it's not good for them. The next thing that pizza has on it is dairy. You saw the slide. Hispanic, Asian, even in the Caucasian population, a lot of people have trouble digesting dairy. Taking your team to Pizza Hut before a game Mm. or before a race, not such a good idea for everybody, right? Think in terms of, I know this sounds crazy, McDonald's is actually a good choice. Um, I know it sounds crazy, but especially after a race, McDonald's is good with food allergies. They keep everything separate. You can get just a burger or just a chicken sandwich that's grilled. You can get french fries that are made with only canola oil and potatoes and salt. So there you have some things taken out. You can get a salad if you want at McDonald's. So your students have choices, and again, I understand it's, it's different the way we're having to think about this. Subway, they can get just lunch meat without the cheese, and they don't have to stand out as the person that's odd or different. Think about the team unity thing once again. And last but not least, my last slide is that um, what I'm talking about is incredibly complex and complicated, but managing all of this on your team really doesn't have to be. And hopefully I helped you just a bit. Is there any questions? Are there any questions? Is the correct English? Yes, sir. Yeah, there were, that kind of, and Tom just was between 30 and 35% of the population. Yes. It's a really large margin of error. It is a really large margin of error. This is what makes this so complex. What they do is they test people in different ways. Think of a big, what I talk to my students about is think of a big circle, okay? And the big circle is food allergies or food intolerances. What we're trying to do is with people who are all different, we're trying to paint little pieces of that pie in to answer the question. So we might have one group of people come in, and they were only 7% on the scale. But we have a whole other group of subjects that come in, and now they're 35%. Genetics are different, right? Because people are so different. So you're taking all the statistics from those 1,500 That's what those researchers did, not me. But what I did is look at a meta-analysis. And one study sample will show 35% with this subject group. Another will show 3%. So it depends on the group of people you have. Is there any difference on how you know, analysts define it? Or? Yeah, what they do is they do it a lot of different ways. So you may have one study that asks people, how did you feel after you had pizza? I felt great. You know, I went to bed and slept 12 hours. So they might have a survey. The other thing they might do is they might do a blood test. They might do a skin test. So all of this varies. And the problem with food allergies and food intolerances, we used to think it could just be this IgE-mediated thing. It used to just build it. You can see it in your blood. What we're finding out now is different people are reacting different because a lot of reasons is because we've changed our food stream so much. Yes, sir. Um, I, I'm on a coaching staff and we're, we're very limited. Um, what would you suggest? 
suggest is the best idea to get this education out, particularly I'm a junior athlete, to, to parents so that they get this education, but it's not using a lot of the coach's time? Um, what do you think about what I put in your packet, the paragraph that could go out at the beginning of the, I tried to do exactly what you're saying. I went through my talk and said, these guys are busy. What can I give them? So do you communicate with your parents via? Website by email. Okay. What I gave you is a paragraph to put in an email and say, thanks every, for everybody for everything that you do. As you know, food allergies and intolerances are becoming more prevalent in our society. And then I gave you that blurb to put in there. We appreciate you bringing stuff. Please think about those that may have more sensitive stomachs than the things that you bring. So maybe one parent will bring, I would love to get that email as a parent. You know what? I'll bring gluten-free cookies that I'll get at the health food store. And I'll put a little sign, these are gluten-free if anybody wants one. You know, parents love to help. I'm a parent. I love to help. Just tell me what you want me to do, and I'll do it for you, okay? If I could add to that, um, I, I won't say I became, but it became known to us that I was gluten intolerant last year on a pretty, pretty significant scale. Word got out to the parents of the kids on our team, and I was amazed. We didn't even ask for anything. I, like most coaches, I don't tend to eat at races until the races are over because I'm afraid I'm going to throw up in the bushes, <laughs> which I usually do. But afterwards, I would have parents come up, I made you this sandwich. It's got no gluten on it. And I was amazed. People want to help. They really do. They do want to help. Really do. So I, I think by reaching out, you may find a, a response that you don't expect in a positive way. We have time for one last question. Anyone? Anybody? Yes, ma'am. Uh, what do you do about the athletes that don't actually know? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I, I only, just because my daughter just found out. Yeah. And had been. My, one of my inspirations for this talk, not only does my son have significant um, food intolerances, but the swimming coach here, um, her daughter is a swimmer in Pennsylvania as an athlete, the problems that she's having. And this was my inspiration to come and talk to coaches because even though she's a coach and her daughter's such a great athlete, they're struggling with what to do and how to communicate to the coach and to the athletic director. And uh, so I think that we're on, the, we're on the cusp of something big right now. This, this is going to be a game changer. I think your athletes aren't feeling well. You've got to bring up the possibility. You're not a physician and you don't want to give them, right. but you want to say, as we're trained to say in my college, have you thought about, and we have some resources available that might be able to uncover some of these issues. And so you say it very craftily. Have you thought about blank? Tracy will be uh, joining us for lunch. She'll be one at the pizza bar. Just kidding. She'll be up there. And thank you for reminding me.